Thank you all for waiting for this, this great moment for us at IMS. It's been nine years in the making of trying to get these two legends to our stage. Um, I, Ibiza favourites, spend a lot of time on the island, but true pioneers of electronic music. Um, I'll bring to the stage, first of all, Mr. Pete Tong, who will conduct this interview. There could be nobody else. And uh, yeah, welcome to Ibiza. Chris Lowe and Neil Tennant, the Pet Shop Boys. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know which one was which. We, do, we should have agreed on a dress one, two, code. One, two. I feel underdressed now. You should have warned me, Neil. I don't want it's anyone to feel underdressed. No, no. How are you? We're good. Welcome We've been here a couple Abitha. of days. Yeah. Well, welcome, welcome. It's, as Ben said, it's taken us about, I think you were the first ones on the list when we started this thing nine years ago. So thanks for eventually getting back to us. <laughs> One of the band has been quite re reluctant about it. Exactly. <laughs> you can be off the, I'm sure I've seen you in DC-10 wearing that disguise. Um, Maybe. I took... I'm not, I'm, not like the, I'm not like your number one fanboy, but I know quite a bit about your history, but I did take a look at um, Wikipedia this afternoon. It was like, Jesus Christ, you guys have done so much. It's like it's almost impossible to know where to start. So going back 32 years ago, how did it all start? Because you had another job you were doing quite well at. Well, actually, when I met Chris, I worked in book publishing. Um, but I'd always been a sort of singer-songwriter. And one day, as the 80s had started, I decided to buy a little synthesizer. It's appropriate we're in this hotel because we later donated it to the Hard Rock in Los Angeles. And it was a Korg MS-10 synthesizer. And then I realized when I got it home, I thought, I didn't know how you got a sound out of it, because I thought it had a speaker, but it didn't. So I went down to my local electrical store, and they made, they made me a, a, a jack plug so I could put it in my stereo. And it was, it was in there that I met Chris, and we started talking about electronic music. That's and, actually, you actually met? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's how the whole, thing, the whole thing began. And so what was the original plan <laughs> when you started making music together? Well, we never what? really had a plan. Um, we just sort of... Um, well, we enjoyed making, you know, I mean, Neil said he had this, um, what we're doing, Why, what did you point for? Yeah, oh, right. <laughs> I um, we um, so, anyway, Neil had bought this weird little keyboard, but um, it was monophonic, and we decided we'd try and write some songs, but we used to just overdub onto this cassette, and, um, and we were very inspired by the music of Bobby Orlando, which was very basic, sort of almost punk electronic music. And um, everything that huge on the kind of high energy scene, yeah. Bobby and um, we, we, we just made some very basic um, sort of demos, not really expecting anything to happen with them. So it was, there was no really big master plan because Neil had a job and I was an um, architecture student at the time. So but you're obviously clearly fans of dance music of the day, though. Yeah, I mean, that was, a, it was an amazing time in the early 80s because you simultaneously had the sort of transition from punk into new romantic, which took everyone back into clubs. You still had the sort of 70s disco thing reincarnated in, in gay, high energy music. And at the same time, you had the beginnings of hip hop. We had, we had uh, Yellow Mandata. on stage earlier yeah. today with yeah. the music they're making. So how did you end up with Bobby? So, so you, you've got your hero, Bobby O. How do you end well, up I got with him job. producing? I got the job at Smash Hits magazine, and we used to have a, a box where people just used to throw records no one was interested in, and I used to go through them. And I discovered that this record, Chris Light, you know, being produced by Bobby O, Passion by the Floods, that Bobby O had a lot of records in the Smash Hits dumper box, and so we started listening to them. And then I, was, uh, I had to go to New York to interview the police for Smash Hits. And I thought, I'm going to phone up this Bobby O character. And I phoned him up, and he invited me out for lunch. And I said, we were about told him about Chris and I writing songs. And he said, let's make a record. And a month later, we were back at Unique, in New York at Unique Studios, and we made what was West End Girls. But the first time it came out, it didn't work. 
No, um, it didn't. But we, you know, you, we, got, you got yourself a record deal pretty quickly. We got ourselves. Uh, we got a manager, Tom Watkins, who I'd already met, and that original version of um, of Western Girls. We were always really grateful to underground DJs, college DJs, because when it finally came out, the second version on EMI. DJs phoned up EMI and said, do you know this, what, what good record this is that you've got? And, um, and we actually had quite a lot of support around America and around Europe. And then that became a hit and the whole thing took off. So how do you react the first time, Ray? Were you, were you crushed when it didn't work the first time? Um, you know, when you've never had a hit record, it sort of seems like an impossible thing. Um, so we weren't crushed, no, and we carried on writing songs. This was a very fertile writing period for us, 83, 84, 85. Because when we finally got around to making our first album, we had all these songs like It's a Sin and Suburbia and um, Rent. And we had too many songs to put on the first album. So the second album was also pretty much written. And how, um, so second time around you, you meet Stephen Haig. Stephen Haig makes the version that everybody knows to this day. And then um, you, you seem to get obsessed by remixing. <laughs> pretty early on and I was looking remixing remixing uh, yeah we've we always loved remixes because um, I mean some people are quite precious about what they've done but we actually really enjoy having someone reinterpret and take what you've done into a completely different direction and it's really exciting when you receive the, the remix and you, and you like it and, you know actually the first one with Bichette Pettibone which actually sounds like an anagram of Pet Shop Voice was it was fantastic to hear and um, we consequently worked with him afterwards I was going to say, what was that like? One of the true, great original disco producers. Well, also, yeah, because at the time in New York in the mid '80s, um, Shep Pettibon used to do these radio mixes. Um, was it on 92 KTU? Anyway, and they were just amazing. Yes, and you used to, when you used to land in New York, and then you get in the in the car, and you just hear this m amazing music playing the whole time, and it was this great mix of Latino house. Well, it wasn't house music, but it was. What was it actually? Latino disco, I suppose. Anyway, it's just really good stuff, isn't it? It was just a very exciting time because there was all the break dancing in the streets and the whole, play the whole of New York was just covered with music. Where were you getting all your information from back in there? Were you, were, you, were you going out to clubs all the time? Were you constantly in record shops? Because it's, it's kind of who's who of... It's amazing when you look back at disco and disco 2, disco 3, which are the remix collections. East Smooth, David Morales, Jam and Spoon, Brothers in Rhythm. It's like there, there was almost nobody that mattered that hadn't got to work on your music, so. Well, the, the past is a bit of a blur, actually. So, um, <laughs> um, we're probably just records that we liked. We'd, if, if we liked a record, we'd go and ask that person to do a remix. And how much was Tom part of that process? Because you, were, you got to work with one of the great characters in the music business, a bit of a kind of McLaren in his own time. Tom was interesting to work with because um, he, he, we used to work against his ideas, really. A classic example was for our first album. Tom said, I've been working for months on the cover. It's going to have 64 cardboard folds that you fold over like this. And it was, it was so excessive that, we, that Mark Farrow came up with the idea of a white sleeve with a, with a, a picture the size of your thumbnail. Um, and so we, our energy kind of worked against his, but at the same time he was very good at banging desks and good to have on your side. And, and he was a big fan of what we did as well. He wasn't involved with um, remix choices, um, you, you know, really we used to just ask people who'd made records that we liked. Uh, Shep Pettibone actually had remixed a Bobby O record for the Flirts, that's when I, I first remember hearing Shep Pettibone's name and realising it was the guy that had done all those remixes. Is there anyone that you didn't get to get a remix from that maybe you asked? I was looking, I couldn't see one from Frankie Knuckles, which seemed like... Frankie Knuckles, chance. we did, um, yeah, we, uh, he did a song called I Want a Dog. Okay. It was a great moment. Right on that. We all, we all um, drove over to Jersey City in this limo from New York, because we were 80s pop stars, and, um, and Frankie Knuckles and, it, and his team had worked on this slightly whimsical song and made it into the most unbelievable, authentic sounding track. And we drove back to New York in the limo with a play on the cassette. And it was a, it was a fantastic moment. Some of, some of the most iconic remixes are probably the, the um, KLF remix of So Hard, MK, um, 
on uh, Can You Forgive Her. Have you got a personal favourite when you look back in terms of a tune that you've remixed? They've had re I've remixed. always loved the Jam and Spoon mix of Young Offender, which they did in their tripomatic fairy tales period. Which, I mean, it's just, I have always like a mix that, um, that goes on a bit of a journey, and, and that's a classic example. We've spent many years trying to get Carl Craig to do a mix for us for the same reason. In fact, he's doing one as we speak. So have um, you ever been turned down? Yeah, so we have been turned down, but, but finally he's doing one for us. Okay. And, when, and then you, at one point in your career, you start remixing other people, and usually those collaborations become, go deeper than the remix. So with, with, the, with the Madonna, with the Killers, you end up working with those artists. What was your, um, th you know, kind of thesis when you sit down to remix another act's work? Well, um, actually one, the Bee Gees once asked us to do a remix and they're one of my favorite groups of all time and um, was just far too intimidated to do it. So we turned them down, which was a shame really. But, um, so what we try to do is, um, turn it into a Pet Shop Boys record. Um, so, that, so it's easier if you're working with a, um, a rock record because you can add four on the floor and do all that sort of stuff and add some rhythm section and cowbells and God knows what. So, um, whereas if you're starting with a dance record, it's, um, we don't often do that. You, um, I mean, Madonna ends up using your mix in a live show. Bowie, you end up doing a TV show with... It always seems to be... Have you got... A, a, well, one of the things, one of the things we do, uh, in the sense, we make a, the remix as though the artist had made a Pet Shop Boys record. So, like with the Killers, Madonna, uh, I also, I also sang on them, um, and also it gives me the chance to do a duet with Madonna. Um, we never actually had her in the studio, or indeed work with Brandon and the Killers in the studio. But it's quite nice to uh, to play and sing on on what becomes their records. And it was great, Madonna. Um, yeah, she had. She had actually used our mix and she used my vocals on the, on the tour. That's good. Um, I, th I thought a turning point for you was probably about 10, 12 years in. I saw a great quote where I think one of your records you know, didn't go to number one or it didn't make the top 10. And I think you, you actually talk about maybe it's time to stop and it's, um, it, it might be all over. Then you start working with Trevor Horn. What was that period? Like he, he did the IMS last year. Did he? Yeah. yeah. Spoke, um, very, spoke very fondly of you. Uh, um, no, we speak very fondly of Trevor. Uh, well, you know, you have your great phase, which I once called our imperial phase, and then you get into the um, sort of survival period. Um, but we've really always been about songwriting, making what we hope are great sounding records, um, and trying to put them on the dance floor as well. And so for us to work with Trevor Horn, um, who is also about, Trevor Horn, who said to us years ago, a pop song is a song that you can dance to with a contemporary dance beat. And, that is, and through his career, he's done that, you know. Uh, but he also likes the big production sound. Um, and he likes like us to bring in ideas from outside pop music. Um, if you think of the Frankie Goes to Hollywood, records, they were unafraid to have very intellectual um, quotes and stuff put in there. Uh, or what he did with Grace Jones, which is, was, was really why we wanted to work with Trevor, because Slave to the Rhythm is one of the best records ever made. Um, and um, uh, so yeah, so he was a sort of natural, we had this idea of making an album called Fundamental, which was about the sort of paranoid state of the world in, in uh, 2006. And he was, he was the obvious person to do it with. Okay. The other, the other area of the business I think you completely revolutionized was um, your approach to playing live. It's, um, I believe at the beginning of your careers you couldn't, af you couldn't afford to fulfill your ideas, which is why you didn't play. Well, we couldn't work out how to do it um, because the way we made the records was just overdubbing in the studio and so we didn't know how you could do that live and uh, so we just didn't do it. You, you well, had a, you it's, had it's interesting because with electronic music, um, and we are, we've never been electronic music purists, but we have been purists about the electronic element of the music. What is the point in trying to play live a, sequ a fast, sequenced keyboard part? It, it, it hasn't come out of a live music tradition. 
It's something that's enabled by the electronic nature of the music. So why would you want to? People, people said to us centuries ago, when you tour America, you've got to have a live drummer. Otherwise, the people won't accept you. Well, of course, that all changed. But, uh, so we, we went on tour with no musicians on the stage at all as a result. Did you take that ethos into the way you performed on television, or did you just think you were going to go and have a laugh by standing there and doing nothing? Well, did it look like <laughs> we were having a laugh? <laughs> um, no, the idea there was that um, when you eventually got on Top of the Pops, it's a really exciting moment. Um, but at the time, Top of the Pops was one big happy party with balloons and everyone having a really you know, great time. And we thought we don't want to look like that. We want to look like we're having a really miserable time. So, uh, not to move very much. Um, so the that, was the, that was the big the idea. Did the director or stage manager uh, uh, come up to you and try and encourage you to do otherwise? No, they, they the, didn't actually. I always remember we, we went into Top of the Pops and um, there used to be, was obviously there's fl- all the camera crew and there used to be sort of cheerleader types who would be organising the audience when they came in. And we did the first run through um, and it was very sort of downbeat. And the whole studio applauded, actually. So they made us feel welcome and relaxed rather than, is, is that it? <laughs> Going back to the, the proper live performance, so by, by 1989, you kind of start to work out how, how you can play live. So just talk us through the process and, the, and the, the, the way you've always embraced kind of the opera and the, the whole theatrical thing of involving people from the theatre as well, and indeed playing in theatres and residing in theatres like the Savoy. Well, it was because of working in the area of electronic music, it occurred to us that it, you didn't, as you weren't going to have a live drummer, it freed up the stage. You didn't have to have musicians on the stage. We did actually have some musicians backstage on the first proper tour. Um, and also, over the years, we'd been, we both liked, we'd seen a, a video of the Grace Jones one-man show We'd seen bits of David Bowie's Diamond Dogs, and uh, was Kraftwerk we, an influence? Yeah, Chris had seen Kraftwerk. So, um, yeah, I saw Kraftwerk. Actually, one of the first things I saw was Soft Cell, and that was great. They just had a tape machine playing, and and it was and David Ball playing the old synth line. That was that was quite inspirational. But it was the idea that we could make it into a bigger, put the music into a sort of theatrical spectacle. Um, and, and another influence was that uh, when I was at Smash Hits, I used to go to tons of gigs. And I always thought there was an amazing rush of energy at the beginning of the gig. And then it would, f- it would, f- it would flatten down a bit. And I, and I think we wanted to see what was possible to, with sort of theatrics to keep the energy level coming back all the time. What, was the, what kind of reaction did you get from the professionals from the world of theatre? Like you worked with... Um David Alden, didn't you? And, you? and you still work with S. Devlin. Yeah. Um, how was that, you know, bringing them into your world and actually getting them to interpret your ideas? Was that...? They were always... Actually, the, the theatrical agents were always a nightmare because they thought, as it's pop music, they wanted m- unbelievable amounts of money to do it. Uh, but once we'd got over that hurdle, people liked the idea of... I've, I often find that people in the theatre... And another, and like classical music, they're always sort of fascinated by pop music because you get such an immediate reaction. I remember when we did our musical Close to Heaven, the first preview, the lights went down, the whole audience applauded. Now, so that was like being at a gig. It wasn't like that doesn't happen. It's Phantom of the Opera every night, and um, and so they were, they always seemed pretty fascinated by it. And, and then with Ayers Devlin, who we worked on. Uh, we worked with on that musical, and that was 15 years ago or something. Um, she's worked with us, she's worked with Kanye West, and now it's become a... She's worked I was with Muse. Say, you've had a, you've had a huge influence on... Are you, prou- you must be yeah. proud of that. You've had a huge influence on them, but on these other kind of iconic acts. Well, I think it's also because a lot of those acts are really nowadays making electronic music, and they've realised the same thing. And also, people have got used to such a show... And then, of course, this started happening in dance music, um, as, as you know, where, like the Chemical Brothers. I remember we played Glastonbury in um, 2000, 
And our then designer, Ian McNeil, who's a really successful stage designer, saw the Chemical Brothers. And he thought their video was better than ours. We know Joe Wright used oh. to work with them. You know, the director oh, actually who, was yeah. doing visuals for, for the Chemical Brothers at the beginning. Um, so many iconic gigs. You know, Glastonbury, you've had a great relationship with Glastonbury. Um, did you ever think an electronic band like yourself would end up on the pyramid stage? Peak time. Sorry, I missed that. Um, He's asleep over there. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not asleep. <laughs> I think we never thought we would play, we never thought of ourselves as a festival band. And that came about because in 1997 we played at a, um, three weeks at a London theatre, the Savoy Theatre, and it lost money. And our agent, Pete Nash, who's still our agent, said if you did these two festivals, it would break even. And one of them was Roskilde, which is the biggest rock festival in Europe. And we headlined the Saturday night. And I remember before we went on stage, just tens of thousands of people there, Chris said, what are you gonna do? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, um, and of course you go on stage and you hear yourself saying, good evening, Ross Gilda. And, um, and suddenly you've turned into a festival band. And you, do, do you feel a bit exposed without your production when we're going into that environment? Oh, we had a little bit of a production. We had a little bit of a production. I think we realized that at festivals, people like, um, if you've got lots of pop hits, you know, it's, um, it, people enjoy it and just, uh, it gets going. Do you have a favorite iconic gig? I mean, you did um, the Olympics, obviously, as well, with Danny Boyle. How did, how did that come about? <laughs> it wasn't really a favorite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun being, you know, we, we were just behind One Direction, I think, so that was quite interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Segwayed. <laughs> uh, you, also, you also did Trafalgar Square, where you got to work with a huge orchestra, which, as we were just talking backstage, I've just started trying to do. So have you got any tips for me, working with a big orchestra, and moving them around? Yeah, I mean, something we've always been fascinated by is the combination of electronics and strings. Um, there's something about the sound of strings and electronics, the, fr the frequencies that really goes together. But I think a problematic area is... Brass always sounds. We've been known to, for the French horn player, to replace the real French horn player with a sample of a French horn because it's because of the timing. Um, so br I think brass players um, sometimes don't fit in quite so easily with electronic. Watch music. the brass players. Yeah. I guess an, another guy you, you mentioned him briefly. I want I want to come back to him. This kind of iconic member of the Pet Shop Boys kind of team um, is Mark Farrow. How important, I mean, to, to me, he's your, like, New Order had Peter Saville, Factory Records. He's, the book catalog, by the way, if anyone's not seen it, you should definitely go and, if you can still buy a copy, it's about that thick. But um, how, how did the relationship with Faro build all over all those years? How does it work? Yeah. <laughs> um, he, is he like Saville? Well, someone has to have an idea at some point, and that's the hard thing. It can take weeks. And he's, he's a bit lazy, he's from Manchester. So is he Savile-like in a sense that he, he'll inflict it on you? Or is, is there a sense of collaboration? No, or? it's more collaborative. Um, it's sometimes to arrive at something very simple takes a lot of discussion and meeting. Like the new album, Super, is just a circle, you know, it says Super in the middle. And um, it took months to arrive at that. Um, and, um, and then... Sometimes, you know, he, I think our most famous album cover is still actually where there's the two of us and I'm yawning. And um, we'd finished the album. That, that artwork wasn't finished, it wasn't actually delivered until about two weeks, four, three weeks before the album came out. And, uh, and that was Mark. We had the photograph and Mark just dropped out the background and made it white. And that, and that looked like the Pet Shop Boys then. So, and he's got very, he sort of understands the music and um, he understands we want a sense of distance, um, that we're not sort of begging to be liked in the, in the imagery, that we'll have quite challenging imagery sometimes. Um, but in recent years, we've just, we've gone more and more graphic. But you took a decision, you were conscious at the time, way back at the beginning, because I believe in your contract, you wanted to make sure that you always had huge amount of control over the way 
things look. Amazingly, which, EMI. Which was, actually, which was really unusual that. back then. Yeah, EMI in our first contract in 85, we said we have to have... Well, because we we'll have working at Smash Hits, I always thought EMI's graphics were really naff, and um, we didn't want to go down that route. And they, they, allowed us, they allowed us to do that. Okay. Do you have a um, favorite collaborator in terms of the, the people you've worked with? Dusty Springfield seems to jump out as someone you, you went back to many times. Is there, um, yeah, have, who's your favorite collaborator, Chris? Um, Put you on the spot. <laughs> is, yeah. um, Ian Wright. <laughs> <laughs> Arsenal. Neil, do you have a... I would probably say Dusty, because um, it was, you know, because we knew Dusty from when we were kids, you know, sitting in your dressing gown and pyjamas watching Sunday Night at London Palladium when I was about nine years old, and she was such an amazing singer, and when she came into the studio, um, it was quite scary, because she was, seemed like such a star. And it was remarkable because how, how everyone said she couldn't sing and she was so brilliant and so insecure about her voice. And that she suddenly had this comeback based on, on what have I done to deserve this. And I think that's one of the things we can feel most proud of, that, um, that we were able to do that with Dusty. And also I think one of my favourite records of ours we ever made is the song Nothing Has Been Proved for the film Scandal which has got such a brilliant vocal by Dusty. And another favorite collaborator, Angelo Badlamenti, the film yeah. composer, did this amazing string arrangement. And another collaborator, Courtney Pine, plays a sax solo at the end. I mean, it's a, it's a real high point. Still a guilty pleasure of mine, that movie, Joanna Wally. Um, and Electronica, of course, that's probably one of my favorites of yours in terms of getting away with it, working with John. I'm always Bird. trying to get an electronic revival, but I... Yeah. I think I'm the only one into it. <laughs> Who came up with the uh, with the with the, lead, the the title line? Getting away with it all of my life. Well, the, what happened with that was um, they sent us some cassettes, Johnny and Bernard, um, and this one was obviously the most catchy. It's sort of catchy sounding tr pop sounding track, and because it was Manchester, it made me think of Morrissey, and so the the lyric is actually about Morrissey. I'm singing f from the point of view of, of Morrissey. I've been walking in the rain just to get wet on purpose, you know. I've been getting away with it all my life. And, uh, I thought it was about Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I've, not, I've not been getting away with it. <laughs> Mad. Present day, um, you're, you're working again with, with Stuart Price, um, who's a, fa a fabulously talented man. So tell us about um, how it works with Stuart. Uh, well, what's great what's different Stuart. about Stuart compared to the other people you work with? What's, what are his special qualities? Um, How does it work with him? Well, he lives in Los Angeles and we're based in London, but we also work in Berlin. And um, so we write the songs, send them over to Stuart. Then we go over there, work with him for a bit, then come back home. He carries on working with them. Um, so it's a very modern way of working, you know, and um, it's all possible because of the you know, the internet and the way technology has developed. You don't actually have to be together to make a record. Stuart also has a very strong idea of what the Pet Shop Boys sound like in 2016. Um, and that's great that someone has a vision of what you should be that they can share with you and you can share with them. Um, and also he knows our music inside out. He told us once that the first thing he ever played on a keyboard was our introductory song tonight, Pananaro. And um, so he, he knows a lot about us, and I think that helps as well. Yeah, and he brings his um, DJ skills, you know, because we, we always use logic, and he can sort of bring all this Ableton stuff into the, into the picture, which, is, um, which, which makes our music sound more contemporary. You're, you're managed by his wife. So do you ever have to give her bad That's news to give him? That's how we got hold him. of him. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever have to what, sorry? No, do you ever have to give, does she have to give Stuart bad news? Do you ever, how does that work? So if you don't like something he's done, does she have to tell him or you? <laughs> no, no, no. We, we deal with him direct on that. Right. Um, generally. Uh, <laughs> at the moment, he's working on the music for our new tour. And um, we did have to ask Angela about that because it was a bit slow. But now it's in full flood. It's all fine. 
That's good. You mentioned Berlin. Um, ben mentioned it earlier, but um, it's, the story seems to have got out there about your new obsession with Berlin and hanging out at the Panorama Bar in Bergheim. So is that true? Which one of you is it, or both of you? Uh, we both go there, but we go um, for pre-lunch drinks. So we cocktails, cocktails even. Yeah, a couple of glasses of prosecco. We go on Sundays. Actually, it's quite interesting because. Um, at Berghain in the queue at 12 o'clock on a Sunday lunchtime, there's of course people arriving, uh, all fresh, and you go in, there's people who've been there for how long, the, for 24 hours or something, and um, it's a very interesting combination of energies, of um, the hardcore of being there all night and the people just arriving, and um, it always seems amazingly alien to go into the main dance floor on this, just some loud bass drum banging away and, and then you go upstairs the panorama bar is a bit sort of more friendly and um, people drinking glasses of Prosecco and different style of uh, you know of electronic music but it's a really great to me you normally see someone you know there and, and it's, I was going to say what do you get out of it of, of hanging around there oh I just well, I like hearing the music seeing what people are up to um, because if I go to Panorama Bar, I normally get told off by the wife that I'm up to no good or something. Oh, do you? <laughs> I can't be but, there for any good reason. But you don't go at Sunday lunchtimes, <laughs> I suspect. Um, <laughs> so maybe you have a slightly different... Um, and then, of course, there's what's going on in the basement. But um, we won't go into that. Um, <laughs> um, we not named a song after... I know we did. Are you moving swiftly on... Um, Politics, I thought I'd ask you about politics, because you've dabbled a bit over the years with things like I'm, I'm with Stupid and stuff like that. What do you make of the current situation with, um, with Donald Trump? And surely it's, it's inspiration for a new tune. Yeah, there's got to be a Donald Trump song, but I don't think we've got it yet. Um, <laughs> I have an awful feeling he's going to win, though, don't you think? I'm really terrible, I think. I don't know, I've just got yeah. this feeling he's going to win. Uh, obviously, I hope he doesn't. Um, it's politics is, um, we, we've, we know, I mean, we've made quite a few sort of political records. I mean, I mentioned before the album Fundamental was um, completely about politics, but we try to do it in a sort of light way or a, uh, we don't make sort of agitprop records, you know. You've always been kind of iconic figures of, of gay culture as well. Do you still feel a responsibility in that world? Are you still kind of spokespeople or has is is things changed a lot since the early days? I don't think we've ever felt like spokespeople for anyone apart from ourselves. Um, we always get very uneasy and we really did in the 80s when pop stars set themselves up as kind of world figures mentioning no names and um, I don't, it makes me, I think both of us feel a bit uncomfortable even though I think it's generally done from the best possible motives. I think what music can do is create an overall culture, uh, a backdrop to how life is carried on. It can change people's um, opinions about social issues. Uh, and also, what gay music, I mean, if you look at the gay contribution to music, which is, starts, really kicks in with disco. I mean, it's... it's um, it's a lifestyle that people outside the gay world have started to aspire to, really. Um, and that's a, an astonishing thing. Are you still as passionate about dance music and, ha and, and being up to speed? I mean, you're obviously hanging out at Bergheim, so I've answered my question, but... It's hard work, isn't it? <laughs> Keeping up with it. Um, <laughs> there seems to be a lot more the, of it. That lot. <laughs> there does seem to be a lot more of it now, though, than there used to be. You could keep a, you know, keep a handle on it all, but, I mean, if it wasn't for your essential new tune, etc. cetera. Um, we probably wouldn't know what was going on. We get the email every week. <laughs> from you, yeah, yeah. No, from you. <laughs> they, they actually yes. did my show many years ago, and they sent which was very nice. Yeah, do you, you come, you've been coming to Ibiza for a, a long time, both of you, I mean, you still? No, I, I, Chris is the Ibiza stall, what not. Okay, how, well, what, have you, what do you think about how it's changed, or how has it changed for you over the last yeah. 20 or so well, years? Well, I first came um, in 1984, um, and I was quite lucky, really, because West End Girls were just getting played, and we'd walk past a bar, and I, did, I, I thought, oh, that's familiar. And um, so that was quite an exciting time to come, but it's obviously changed a lot since then. I mean, the clubs didn't used to have roofs on, 
And um, what were your favourite clubs when you first? What were the clubs? Well, the first time we came, coming from Blackpool, uh, you have to, you know, the club shut at two, so we we got there about eleven, and there was no one in. No, probably about twelve, and there was no one in. So we gave up because we didn't have any money and went home. And my impression of Ibiza was it was a great island, but it's no good for clubbing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but since then, I've been back a few times, and um, I've had some of the you know, happiest times of my life on, on this island. You've got a favourite club here? Yeah, DC10, Circo Loco. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you got the look from. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got some Italian friends, and yeah. um, they're very stylish. And um, but I, I just love that demented clown looking down at you. Mad. Are you coming? But you're going to come back again this year? Uh, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other clubbing cities around the world where you've got a lot of inspiration or enjoyed hanging out? Well, we spend quite a bit of time in um, Latin America, and um, there's this. Fantastic club, but amazing. The, the, the best room was playing reggaeton, um, which, is what, which inspired a couple of tracks on our latest album. But that, everyone was having such fun in there. People walked in the room and, and started to beam with laughter and smiling, you know, and it was just such a lovely atmosphere in there. And it, that was quite inspirational. And what about um, New York in the 80s? Were, were you, oh, well, were you just, Paradise Garage or...? That was amazing. We were so lucky to have been around at that time in New York and to be in the Paradise Garage and um, what was it, the one? Um, what was it, the one called? Danceteria? Or? Danceteria, yeah. the Fun House. The Fun House, we yeah. were in the, We were in the DJ booth house. with, with um, Jelly, Bean. Jelly Bean when he was Madonna's boyfriend, you know. He offered us a lollipop. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that was a great, that was a great scene, that Latin hip-hop, pop, scene that was somehow influenced by Depeche Mode as well. It was amazing musical of that. We used to love it. Have you got any good Larry Levan stories? I don't think we ever met him. You never got to meet him? Um, well, I don't know, actually. No, we definitely didn't meet him. I don't even know if he was DJing. But it did have, I know everyone goes on about it, but the, the sounds, you actually felt the music. It, the, the bass coming through the floor was just phenomenal. It was, um, it was a great entrance to a club as well, along this long ramp and it felt very exciting in those days going to a club in New York. It felt sort of a bit dangerous. Actually, talking of dangerous clubs, there were a few dodgy ones in Chicago and Detroit that we went to a couple of times. We but went to Chicago. I like it when there's an element yeah. of danger. We went to Chicago in 1988 and on promotion and we asked EMI's local promotion person to take us to the house clubs and they'd never heard of house music. <laughs> and it was Chicago. Um, Did you ever find one? <laughs> um, well, actually, they, uh, they found the urban dance promoter, uh, Rep, and she, she knew where they were. And that was actually quite an exciting night. And did you ever make it to Studio 54? We had a party there, but I'd love to Years have gone later. there, at, yeah. you know, when it was happening. <laughs> uh, the, the, the club that had replaced Studio 54 that we used to go to was Area. Yeah, which, which was amazing because um, there were all these living artworks and they used to change the way the club looked every month. And I think there's, there was an amazing, I don't know if, I don't really go clubbing in New York very much, but there was that thing in New York where you, we were just talking about last night, where you got a whole incredible range of people from, fr from kind of drag queens and rent boys and punks all the and then suddenly at about midnight, all these people from Upper East Side dinner parties would arrive wearing, wearing tuxedos, and you turn around, and Andy Warhol was there. And it was that incredible mix of everyone that really was, was a very New York thing. And, it, but it was, and I think that's one of the great things that we still like about clubbing, is when there is a f feeling that a community has been created out of a disparate group of people. And it's not all about money, it's about all being there and forgetting about what's going on outside. Your career, 30, 34 odd years, um, it doesn't look, when you look at your discography, like you ever took a break. What is it, what is it, did you ever take, have you ever taken a break? And what does it take to stay creative for that long? And how do you, where do you get your inspiration from today? You've kind of done it all. <laughs> well, we, we have never taken a break, but, um, I mean, apart from a couple of months or something. 
But I think it's because if you're, it's like you're exercising, you have to exercise the muscle of creativity to keep the muscle strong. And, and I think um, it's, a bit, it's a bit like that. We have, we'll have phases where we're not, like this year, I don't think we've written any songs this year because we haven't, we've been doing, work on the album coming out and all the rest of it and starting to work on the tour. Um, and that's good, you know, if you have a little bit of time off from writing songs, then you go back to the studio and you suddenly seem to have tons of ideas. But at the same time, as a lyricist, I continually have ideas and write them in my phone. So, I've, so when we do go in the studio, I've got something that I've already worked on. And how do you get the kind of energy inspiration for all the touring? For a, for a couple of guys that didn't want to really do much on top of the pops the first time, your touring is... is well, we've got up. to earn some money now. Right. <laughs> so, so that's why we go on that's tour. Right. Otherwise, we'd just sit home making records. I actually, I like touring, actually. I think it's... Okay. Um, I, li I like the meet and greet. <laughs> One of your great quotes, quotes, Chris, was, I don't like country and western, I don't like rock music, I don't like rockabilly, I don't like rock and roll, particularly, I don't think I like much in it at all. Do you still feel that way? Sorry. Uh, my quote. Song, I, I'm hearing you from over there. I know, it is a bit it's confusing really weird. up here. What is it? Do you like anything uh, these days? Oh, that's true. I like what I like. And I, um, I, I, it's very black and white with me. Um, there's not, I, Neil can sort of like things generally or a bit, whereas I either like it or hate it. There's not much in the middle. So apart from Ian Wright, what do you like? <laughs> <laughs> musically. Yeah, what's t what does turn you on these days musically? Um, what do I like? Um, you see, you've put me on the spot. That's I can't think of anything. Reggaeton. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah, there's a record. Um, I can't remember the name of it, so it's a waste of time asking me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, remaining ambitions. Is there, are there still boxes you feel you need to tick as a, as a group? Um, are there still places you want to play, things you want to achieve? Yeah, there, there are. Um, I mean, you're always chasing the idea, for me, of a sort of perfect record that's exactly the right balance of euphoria and intelligence and sound and and sort of crazy instinct. Um, well, you were being a music journalist. You were you were a pretty tough review to get at the beginning so do you feel sometimes you're that's what you're you know you're almost reviewing your own are, there's, you, there's are always, you competitive as a as a writer oh no i'm not competitive like chris martin i believe is very competitive um no we we sidestep competition and we have done from the beginning by we sort of work we've tried to create a, a world of our own that we operate within uh, we can invite people into that world or we can share other people's worlds, worlds like we did with electronic. Um, but we sort of do our own thing and, um, and don't worry too much about competition. And what's the plan for the rest of this year then? We're doing four shows at the Royal Opera House um, in London. We, they've been trying to get uh, in, uh, opera houses all around the world in the summer. You know, the opera company and the ballet company can go on tour or go on holiday or something. And so they invite different people to come in. It's normally just a ballet company from abroad. But they have been trying to get a new audience in there. And a few years ago, Rufus Wainwright did a week there. Uh, we were trying to do a, an ele electronic music festival using all the spaces within the Royal Opera House. But that was a bit too much for them, unfortunately. Uh, and then they again asked us, so we decided we would launch our tour by playing four concerts there. And then we're playing North America and some European dates uh, in October, November, December. And that's going to extend into a bigger world tour as, uh, next year. Okay. And would you, um, would you go back on that and try and do an electronic music festival at some point? If you go. Well, I think it was a really good idea, and I think they made a mistake not doing it, because uh, there are people, you know, um, an institution like the Royal Opera House in London gets paid a vast amount of subsidy, cultural subsidy, and I know there are people in it who think their remit should be a bit wider about the people who get in that. It's an amazing building and, and amazing experience, and um, so I, I, th I wonder whether they will actually think about that again.
Are you still, the other, one other question I had for you is to, did, why you actually never ran a dance label with all these remixes? You've started labels and kind of stopped them. I can't hear. No, it's, it's weird. Sorry. No, do you ever thought of... <laughs> I, should, I should have come with them in one of those form things. Why would you have had a dance label? Well, we did have um, a label. It wasn't really a dance label. I think it's too much hard work. You must know this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't like hard work, do you? <laughs> he likes to chill. I think we'll... Um, I'm sure we've got a few questions from the floor. We've got a bit of time. So if anyone has got a question for um, Chris and Neil, oh, God, step awesome. up to the mic. <laughs> Hello. Um, I know you have a special appreciation and um, relationship with art, design, and architecture. And I was just wondering what your favorite building is. Well, he's the, he's the architect. I know, but favourite's not easy, is it? Um, we were at the, um, the um, Broad Museum in Los Angeles a couple of months ago and thought that worked very well. Um, quite an exciting space. It's, it's spelt broad, but it's pronounced Broad for some reason. Um, you probably know that. Um, I can't think of anything else. Um, I hate the shard. <laughs> <laughs> It's sinister. There's a really annoying thing around the world now of building landmark, iconic buildings where the ideas are often just ego-driven by the architect or just silly. And, um, and it's a shame because there's been such a lot of great modern architecture like Frank Gehry or someone like that who do, does something really original. And it gets sort of perverted into these silly things. Like the Shah just looks, you know, Chris always says, he looks like he just drew it on a napkin and said, build that. And apparently that's what it did happen. Yeah. Looks like one of those white hats. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a <laughs> From that gang in America. <laughs> um, another question? Move the mic around here. Yeah. Being an, uh, an Italian kid growing up in the 80s, I'm particularly attached to Paninaro, of course. So, um, how did you come up with inspiration about writing a song about that? Um, well, we used in, the, in, our, in the early days of Fetch Up Voice, we spent quite a lot of time doing promotion in Italy. Um, it was the one place we wanted to have success, and ironically, we've not really got much success there, which is typical. But, um, so, we spent a lot of time in Milan, and we noticed um, these very stylish Italian youths hanging around... Um, Sandwich bars, which is of course why they're called paninari, um, and sitting, you know, they just so dressed so well. And it was in the days when you could only get um, Emporio Armani in, in Italy, and they always used to wear Timberland boots, which were really hard to get hold of as well. And they just looked fantastic. And so we were totally inspired by this sub uh, youth subcult. Um, but well, the people that actually liked us in Italy were the sort of more alternative, dressed in black types. And so when we um, um, became obsessed with paninari, they sort of jettisoned us. <laughs> Good question. Go on. Another one. Hi, I was wondering if you were today 19 year old, what would you do? What, well, actually, if I was a 19, I'm assuming you mean music. Um, actually, I would start a rock band because I think when you look at rock music um, nowadays, it's just up for grabs. There's nothing interesting happening in it. Um, and yet there's a huge audience out there and a huge history. And also when rock music, I mean rock music always updates itself by using dance music, technology and sounds and all the rest of it. But I think there is, I think it's a shame there isn't something happening out there in creatively in, in rock music. I mean, maybe this isn't the venue to say that though. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Mark Jones from Wall of Sound. Um, and Pete did ask you the question I was going to ask, which was what it was like to work with Stuart Price, um, because I signed in when he was 14, 15 years old. Ah. <laughs> was he just 15? Well, I, from what I can remember. Um, he still but, looks 15. Sorry? He still looks 15. Still no, looks he does. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great to see him progress to be one of the most influential producers in the world now. Um, if you had to name one track that made you do what you do creatively, what would it be? 
by someone else? Yes. Well, there was this one track that we discussed earlier, um, which was Passion by the Floods by Bobby O, which had everything we liked. It had this raw electronic sound. It had, it was sort of very sexy. Uh, it had an ecstatic quality. And yet there was something, there was something almost punk about it. Um, the way it's edited together in the long mix, there's actually a mistake keeps, keeps coming around. And there's something about the whole sound of it. And also it just felt very new um, at the time. And so that's probably been the single most um, influential record on us. And what about Chris? Well, I think there are different influential records for different periods in your career. Um, another one just after that was Love Ride by Nuance, produced by Rondin Miller, who we worked with um, on, let's, was it like, let's make lots of money. Um, and that was sort of a slightly later period where we'd been clubbing in New York. And then house music had a huge influence when that came along. And Electro Clash, all these things have some sort of influence on where you are and what sort of music you want to make. Have you, have you got a songwriting formula? Is there, does he start with you know, some chords and you put some lyrics or is it a title first or do you have the melody humming into a, a It's show? kind of all of those things. I mean, on a computer, as you know, you've got to have a title. Um, and sometimes Chris has a title, you know, and sometimes I say, let's call it this. And, um, yeah, Chris will start playing he just goes into a world of his own, really, at the computer. And, um, and I'll sit at the back of the studio with my computer, going through all the lyrics I've written and seeing if any of them fit. Sometimes I'll have written something on the piano. We'll bring that in and work on, work on that. Um, Are you good outside of the studio as well? Do you come, are you working at home? Or? I, have a little, I have a piano at home and a guitar. If I write something, it tends to be written on the piano and guitar, or guitar. Okay. We've got time for a couple yeah. more questions, I think. Yeah, one more. Um, no one in this room <laughs> cannot say they've been touched by one song of yours at all. And I remember okay. I, grew up, I grew up with you guys listening the whole time, recording the chart show on a Sunday night and playing it back. <laughs> and once I was standing on King's Cross Station, and I looked to my right, and there was Neil Tennant standing next to me, my hero. <laughs> and I looked at you and went, ah! I couldn't say anything. Neil, hello. Chris, mm -hmm. you're amazing. Hello. Thank you. Can I ask you one question? Yeah. Are you playing tonight? If not, it's Pete, come on, why not? Are we what, sorry? Are you playing tonight? And if not, why not? Playing tonight? I know, uh, no, no, actually no one, actually we have a discussion every year uh, where we get, where someone invites us to play in Ibiza. And That's usually us. It's usually you, um, or it's um, Ibiza Rocks, or it's the people who do the thing on the top of the uh, old city. Oh, that is you, is it? That's you, okay. Is that, I didn't know that was you. Um, well, and then our tour manager who's standing over there does a budget, and we say it doesn't work. It's that damn opera again. It's the, it's the whole production. Um, but one day it will work. One day it, it you will. ever tried DJing? Yes. It's, that's really hard, isn't it, DJing? People don't realise outside yeah, the DJ world how yeah. difficult that is. Um, I DJed at my sister's party the other day, and, and um, people keep giving you drinks the whole time, and you're trying to concentrate on getting the beats right, and, and it all goes wrong. Then you play the same record twice by mistake, and then you can't <laughs> find the one you want to play, and you're like, ah, oh. by the end of it, you're so stressed. So I have nothing but admiration <laughs> for DJs. <laughs> but can I just say, I just say my, fav my favorite DJ story was, is our friend Tom Stephan, Super Chumba, was DJing somewhere, and, he was, and, the, and there's a guy completely off his trolley who kept coming up to him and saying, two gin and tonics, mate, two gin and tonics. And he thought he was the barman. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. We've got one up there. Hey, hey, hey guys, Tom from Ultra Records. You just mentioned that the German Spoon remix is your favorite remix. And Jerem from German Spoon actually is a very good friend of mine. I was with his, in his studio two weeks ago and I just texted him that you said that. 
and he just texted back to say thank you very much for the props and I will return to the studio next week because we start working on a cover version of Being Boring. So oh, now yeah. that's oh, it. <laughs> Very nice. Thank right. you. Thank you. One more question. Hi, I'm Power Dress. Um, how did you write Western Girls and things like that, uh, songs like that. Did you come up with the lyrics first and the melody first? Do you hear it in your head walking down the street like crazy artists that usually do? Well, West End Girls is the only song we've written like that. Um, sadly. Sadly. <laughs> um, Let's do another one. It's still their biggest hit. And it was, <laughs> and it was a, a very unusual way of doing it because as I mentioned very earlier, that one of the things we liked in the 80s was early hip-hop, like Africa Bambata, and we particularly liked the record, The Message by Grandmaster Flash. And one day I set out to write a rap in the style of, um, you know, broken bottles everywhere, people pissing in the street, man, they just don't care. And I came up with, sometimes you're better off dead, there's a gun in your hand, it's pointing into your head. And, and, and I recited this to Chris. Uh, we wrote some music and it was rubbish. But then a while mm. later, we, we wrote this instrumental. With Chris playing this wonderful bass line. And it was just instrumental and, and I took it home. And it suddenly occurred to me that you could do that rap and then a bit of the rap turned into a chorus where you sang in a Western town, etc. And then, we were, and this was right before we went and worked with Bobby O. And we worked with Bobby O and Chris started to play that bass line. And I, played, I said, oh, that rap works over this. And so the original record of West End Girls is actually the first time I, I sang it as well. And so it was a sort of miraculous process, that. And sometimes writing a song is, and a lot of songwriters will say this, it feels like luck, like you just happen to be in the right place at the right time. And West End Girls was certainly one of those. And we're very grateful for it. <laughs> I think that's it. Um, think Chris, that's it. Neil, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Gracias.